coming up on this episode of Belief Hole. One of the fascinating things is lightning is seen. Either right at the point of exiting the encounter area or immediately after a lightning storm would come in. Interesting. Spinning is a common trait. Yeah. So creepy to see that in the sky. A spinning pyramid just over treetops above your neighbor's house, right? That's mm-hmm. got to be terrifying. Got to be terrifying. Got to be terrifying. People who started these programs are people who are fascinated with not just UFOs, but the connection to paranormal activity, cryptid encounters, orbs of light, hauntings, poultry guys activity, high strangeness. They were able to get people at places like the Defense Intelligence Agency to spearhead these investigations. So not necessarily to say that this disclosure, if it does come at all, is from a benevolent place necessarily, but the origins are. The people who started it, I think, were trying to discover what's going on in our weird reality. In our weird reality. In our weird reality. I thought, how crazy would it be if there were corroborating accounts of right pyramidal UFOs flying pyramids in the sky? Have people seen this? And I found 30 to 40 accounts of people seeing hovering, floating, three-dimensional black pyramids. That's crazy. Weird. It really does start to sound like this is something that's been going on for a long time. Long time. Long time. If something really does happen and they start wanting more control, that's when we have to be really careful. Right. Then you have to start to think critically about what they're saying. Just because they're admitting there are aliens or UFOs or whatever doesn't mean that what they're telling you is the truth about those phenomena. Because they're the ones feeding you the information. It's hard for me to believe that if things escalate, that we're going to get the truth of it. Yeah. But we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Access granted. This is the tip of the iceberg. Like, there's so much more that's there. And this is coming from insiders within the Pentagon saying there are images and video of things that are 50 feet from cockpits. We're seeing the bottom of the barrel of the evidence. They are out there. Maybe this has been a secret yeah. for so long that yeah. they know it has to come out at some point. We're just seeing the tip of the pyramid. Tip of the pyramid. Tip of the pyramid. Conspiracy. Synchronicity. Sasquatch. Homunculus. Alien races. Satanism in Hollywood. MK Ultra. Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. Close like, the door, in. Jury. Close your door. What's the uh, inner earth disagreements? Ghost dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman. Bohemian Grove. Corey Feldman. Magicians are demons. Specters. Spirits. Spirits sleep paralysis. Occultations. Strange disappearances. Sky whale phenomena. Yes. Alternative history. Shadow people. Shh, quiet. I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. Oh, that's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf towers. I would never talk about. It. That's old. Y2K. Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. Well, hello, hello. I'm Jeremy. I'm John. I'm Chris. Yes, you are. You are beautiful brothers of mine. Welcome to the show, guys. Yeah, it's going to be a good one today. It's going to be a pretty intense one today, I think. Is it? Well, let me just say, Chris and John, this is a topic that we haven't done. The show started out, oh, you're paranormal show. You're going to be talking about aliens all the time, right? UFOs. We haven't, and there's a number of reasons for that. I guess that we just didn't get into this stuff. But, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, okay, with my, my <laughs> flat earth flirtation, sure. Yeah. That's going to be part of it. But mm-hmm. <laughs> generally, with the amount of, quote, disclosure that we see happening, at least what the media has been pushing lately. I don't know if you guys watch the television or get on YouTube. Television. Television. Thank you, John, because that's what it is. It's a bunch of lies. You've had a lot of caffeine today. A lot of caffeine today. Um, And we're going to get into that. So this is the question, right, guys? And let's put this to you guys out there in the hole. How many of you think that what we're seeing is a true disclosure? What are you talking about? We're seeing a lot of UFOs in the news, right? Over the last year, I would say, official releases from the government saying that these are unidentified flying objects. Since uh, 2017, so the past four years, we've had these. Right. Since we started the show. But it's been increasing, like, bigger drops right. have been happening The leak has been open to more of a flow. And that's what's interesting is, actually, our inaugural episode of the show, which is now behind a paywall because it's it's pretty rough. It's our early stuff. But if you guys are seeing <laughs> you can listen to it. Pretty rough. It's our early stuff. But the first episode, we talked about the Tic Tac UFO, right? 2017, yeah, the like, Nimitz God, encounter. Wow, it's been that long? Yeah, first episode, that was man. was three years ago? Mm-hmm. Holy snows. Yeah, and since then... And I would argue leading up to that and after, we've had an acceleration of 
this quote disclosure, this basically admittance of what we're seeing right. in the news and what we're going to talk about today. Chris has done a lot of research on the background of kind of the, the timeline of this quote disclosure or the development of this information and it's leaking to the um, people and through the press. We're going to discuss that. And we're also going to discuss the ideas behind, I mean, my biggest question to this, and I just want to get this out right off the bat, and this is a whole topic, so we'll get into this later, but why, why on earth or off earth mm-hmm. would the government yeah, million dollar question exactly what's the true agenda behind that we'll get to those possibilities coming up do they truly just want an informed public about this situation well even more so what do they want us to think about them the yep. idea that they say well we don't know what this is why would they be even be telling us i don't same? know so we're going to get to those questions <laughs> coming up here and i think it's gonna be a fascinating conversation we talk about the stuff behind the scenes but it'll be good to cover this on today's episode yeah and i think what spurred the concept to do i think this episode now And you're right, like we have had this increasing disclosure that's been going on, if you want to call it that, but the recent release of the Pyramid video. Yes. I think, Mm. have you seen that yet? Mm -hmm. Okay. I sent it to you. That's right, you did send it to me. And it was sent to me by my good friend, Mike. Thank you, Mike. But yeah, this goes back, as we said, since 2017, since these disclosures started to increase. And, you know, when it comes to like our show, you're right, we haven't done nearly as much UFO or, or extraterrestrial episodes as I've wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's funny because going into it, I kind of thought that was what I was most fascinated. Mm-hmm. But it just became more paranormal, more paranormal, more high strangeness stuff. Yeah. Well, I think we understand that there is a larger context. Right. And what's interesting about that is we're going to get into how the government and programs within the government, people who are initiating these programs have the same idea. I've kind of realized going through this research in the past few days that the initiation of some of these projects were because they believed that there was more than the nuts and bolts UFOs that were seen in the sky. They believed, like we believe, that it's all connected to paranormal activity. It's a larger matrix of high strangeness, right, that all seems to be this connective backdrop for this random phenomenon. Right. Then those nexus points like Skinwalker Ranch, mm-hmm. right, which is going to come into play because you have government bodies or groups coming out of these different institutions that are studying the phenomenon at these locations backed by people like Bigelow, right? Right. Which you're going to talk about. I'm going to get into that because I think it's important and it's interesting to talk about how this stuff started to form right, within the government. Are we going to get into Tom DeLonge's stuff at all? In a peripheral right, way. I didn't focus on DeLonge. On it. We're going to bring up Luis Elizondo because he's a, a big part of this story. He is part of Academy of the Stars now after he left the Pentagon oh. project. Which was Tom DeLonge's initiative, right? Right. If there's ever going to be a PSYOP, it's coming from Blink. Well, that, one <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the thing I think, and we'll get into this later. We'll keep teasing stuff, but with Tom DeLonge, I think it's interesting. I was always a Blink-22 fan growing up as a kid, and uh, he used to sing about being abducted like the one he had a song one of his songs about you know in the backyard i can't remember the song now oh but, yeah uh, uh it was it was a good song it was catchy <laughs> that was great jeremy in the backyard it was on enemy of the state God, i can't remember the, oh the there's song something goes. very Be wrong and no I'd it's not yeah whatever late. yeah been gone since yesterday anyways missing time yeah he was abducted that was that's the story <laughs> that's the song <laughs> oh adam's song good song i can play that one they did have a pretty good discography yeah mm-hmm. they were you know they yeah they were like the first pop punk band that I mm-hmm. started listening. Super catchy. Yeah. And it's Super when I think catchy. pop punk started getting bad, in my opinion. But now I look back and I think, ah, you know, I like good I miss it. <laughs> yeah. Compared to stuff I hear, it's on the radio now. Right. I'm an old man. Oh, the newfangled kid rock. Kid rock. Kid rock. Kid rock from the kids. Yeah. Kid rock. Yeah. We're going to get into Academy Stars a little bit. There is a debate there that I just want to mention. The debate between, you hear the Greer perspective, right? Stephen mm-hmm. Greer, who's, it's all benevolent. Right. Generally, like this is these, they're right. all good. So he looks at Academy of Stars and think that it's, I'm kind of align myself with Greer a little bit in that aspect. Like I, I do see the ability for clandestine groups within the government to manipulate groups like Academy of the Stars who I think they get funding from, right, mm-hmm. Department of Defense or something, or they, they work in conjunction. I could see that being a, a tool that's used to manipulate the information. It's publicly funded, I'm pretty sure, Academy of the Stars, but they've been working with, I know they signed a contract with the government right. relatively recently to work on some of this material that's that right. was discovered. That's right, exclusive, right? But part of that contract was like, you can, I think you can only release what we say you're allowed to release. Right. So again, you're, you're pulled back into this cloak of what is being allowed to be disclosed. Exactly. And with Greer's point of the useful idiot kind of idea with, I think he looks at Tom DeLonge as like someone who has a high profile that really wants to believe and that can be potentially manipulated. And that was my point is just knowing like his music and knowing he's interested in the stuff from an early age. I could see someone who just wants to believe and not having that skeptical side maybe of the government that you could be taken in. When you're that famous, like it goes to your head on some level, most people, I'm not saying everyone, but there's a chance that that's going to be this self-aggrandizing sort of 
Like becomes um, a part of your identity, maybe? Yeah, like, I'm not saying this I see for what you're sure, saying, yeah. but I could see how a personality like that might be easier to manipulate. Right. You know, this massive star where everyone says you're always amazing, and then you're like, we have this other thing for you. Like a hero complex. Yeah. About. Having that platform and What's that power. What's the word power, for that? Delusions of grandeur. Even just like having that power and thinking like, yeah, you could be that hero and someone could give you the access to where you could help everybody. Right. Like, and it could yeah. come from a good place. Yeah, we don't know. This is all speculation. But it is a potential, you're right, it's a potential way to control someone, mm -hmm. that kind of desire. But who knows? And this specifically, I mean, I want to get more into what's been coming out with ATIP, which is the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. That was the Pentagon program that was confirmed to be an actual program that was studying this phenomena and how that developed through Bigelow and the experience that a scientist had from the Defense Intelligence Agency who actually went to Skinwalker Ranch, had an experience there. Oh. And that's what began all these programs. That's what started like NIDS, right? No, this was post-NIDS. Bigelow started NIDS. A lot of acronyms. NIDS went in, into Bass. So uh, we're going to get into it. But okay. and that's one of the reasons I want to do this episode. You know, when this pyramid stuff came out, I wanted to break down how this began because it all starts back with Bigelow, Skinwalker Ranch. I wanted to talk about this because it's complex. There's a lot of acronyms. What begat what? when right. it comes to mm -hmm. these programs. And I think it's important and it's interesting to, to find the origin. So I want to talk about that. We're going to cover this pyramid stuff and then we'll get into how much of this is disclosure, how much of this is misdirection. And just for the weirdies out there, the people who like the weird, like myself, what I love about this, the sighting that Chris is about to get into is this pyramid, what looks like a pyramid flying in the sky, right? Essentially, that's, that is the sighting that has been leaked recently. And... That to me is such a freaky, fascinating idea because we see like UFOs, we see, you know, the regular silver discs, the triangles, whatever. The delta shape. To see a, like a gigantic three-dimensional pyramid where you like, how does that fly? Like just, there's everything wrong with it that I shouldn't be there. Yeah. I mean, honestly, when I first watched it, I didn't see it multiple times. So I'm interested to, cool. to see it. Yeah. If you slow it down frame by frame, there's one that passes the flashing pyramid that's floating over this battleship. There's two more pyramids in the background of the video that you can mm -hmm. faintly see because they're not flashing. So the two pyramids that are behind it, there's this turning aspect to it. You can really see the three-dimensionality if you slow it down frame by right. frame. Looks like a metallic pizza. This was such a crazy, fascinating concept to me. And it reminded me of Stargate. reminded me of Oblivion, these movies where they, they had a flying freaking pyramid. It was such a weird idea. And I thought, how crazy would it be if there were corroborating accounts of right. pyramidal UFOs, flying pyramids in the sky, hovering pyramids? <laughs> Have people seen this? You know, have people witness something like this. So I went on New Fork, which is National UFO Reporting Center database, and I went on MUFON and I correlated these accounts searching for keyword pyramid. And I found 30 to 40 accounts of people seeing hovering, floating, flying, three dimensional black pyramids. That's interesting because it's not something you That's hear crazy. about often. Yeah. And so I collected. Freaky. Yeah, right? Finally, I get the freaky factor from you. But I've selected a handful that we can go through later of these actual eyewitness accounts of these different crafts seen throughout the last decade. Awesome. And some are pretty incredible, pretty freaky. And some, there's a couple funny ones because, you know, they sound a little out there, but there's going to be funny ones. There's yeah. going to be funny ones. But it, it, it's fascinating, man. I just, I love that concept because, you know, if there is some advanced technology, whether it's earthbound, beneath the earth or extraterrestrial, whatever you want to call it, this technology, there's no reason why you couldn't have, depending on the propulsion, electromagnetic, you know, whatever they're using, they don't necessarily need to be aerodynamic if they're creating, you know, envelope slip streams or however they're functioning, whether it's conscious plurality of location, location duality. What is that called? The spooky action and distance. Spooky action distance. Oh, I know what you're talking about. The term with location. Simultaneous location. I can't remember what it is. Non-locality. The point being, there are a lot of different ways you can operate craft potentially theoretically in all kinds of ways if you have, you know, that kind of advanced knowledge. So right. You could have a floating building like we covered in our listener stories episode last where you could have a floating pyramid. It's just, it's a terrifying thing to witness, I would imagine. Oh, yeah. And that's why I'm fascinated by it. So we're going to get into real accounts later on. So stick around for that in the second half of the episode, guys. But first, we're going to get into the timeline of where we're at now, what this quote disclosure might mean, and whether or not we should trust it. We're going to get into a little Operation uh, Mockingbird as well, a little CIA conversation coming up. So stick around for the nitty gritty, guys. All right, so yeah, just to bring everybody up to speed as much as is possible, and I, my brain is still all flurry with acronyms. <laughs> yeah, and you were freaking out with all the acronyms. There's just, the, the more I read, the more, because, you know, we looked into this during the first season of the show because, you know, we had the explosive article from New York Times, the Pentagon 
confirming leaked videos, the gimbal footage, the flare one footage and the go fast footage. These were all different alleged UAPs or unidentified aerial phenomenon that were caught by pilots from ships like the USS Roosevelt and the USS Nimitz. The Nimitz, if you remember, that was the one where Tic Tac, David Fravor was stationed where he experienced that Tic Tac UFO. Remember Mm -hmm. that? Yeah, so that came out, the Nimitz, everything was coming out. The one with David Fravor, I think one of the most fascinating ones because he's got up close personal encounter. You know, they get this blip, something's out there. They go out, they see this this white Tic Tac shape, which actually he said was about the size of his plane, maybe a little bigger. What, was he in a, a jet? He was in an F-18. Okay. He's with one other guy and they're they're basically like circling above this thing. And he's like, I'm gonna go down and get a closer look. And his buddy's like, all right, I'm gonna stay up here. All right, roger that, Dave. You know, <laughs> yeah, like Goose and Maverick. It's like Goose and Maverick. And, like uh, Goose and Maverick. So Fravor goes down towards this thing and it notices him and it starts coming up and it meets him. And then they start circling each other. And David Fravor's like, I'm gonna get real close to see what this thing is. So he cuts through that circle that they're kind of circling each other. And as he's going towards it, it just disappears. But he said when he arrived there underneath where this thing was over the water- This is the creepy part. Was a larger object. Underneath the water. Yeah, I forget how, maybe 400 feet or something, Mm -hmm. the water was bubbling. So whatever this thing was, was just a tiny aspect of this for this encounter. Mm-hmm. Almost like a probe. That he had, yeah. And then of course, it, you know, that thing's gone by the time he gets back. But this white thing I hadn't heard before, it also had uh, what looked like little appendages on it, on the bottom of it. It's described like a propane tank with like oh. almost little things on the end, I heard which that. is interesting because the most recent disclosure of this pyramid structure, it also comes with a few other objects that have been sighted that were released and conferred by the Pentagon. You've got an orb shaped thing that went into the water. I remember hearing about this. Yeah. The circle? Yeah. The, this like orb type thing. The new metallic blimp image, which I think is the most fascinating, but which kind of reminds me of the Tic Tac because even though it's silver, it has these appendages on it. And these three were all taken by this fighter pilot. We'll get into that. But you had these programs that we kept hearing about, like ATIP and um, NIDS, you know, BASS, these Bigelow programs. And how are, how are they all connected? How are they all part of this story? So this comes from Popular Mechanics. And this kind of illustrates the beginning of these programs. They did a good job of breaking this down. So on December 16th, 2017, the New York Times disclosed that the Pentagon had secretly funded research into UFOs through the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP. The article goes on to say, as if the U.S. government quietly investigating UFOs wasn't enough, for the first time, the public also got a chance to see three videos captured by the U.S. Navy showing what has been claimed to be, quote, unidentified aerial phenomenon, or UAP which is now, you know, obviously the, the more right. popular acronym instead of UFO. It seemed like they purposely changed the name from, U- Maybe. from UFO to UAP. And that could be like a, a PSYOP type idea. I mean, it could be that, and this was kind of my thought, if they want people to start taking UFOs more seriously, because the argument that there might be a false flag, the Project Bluebeam concept or whatever, the idea that they're trying to get this disclosure out there for everyone so that people are primed for something, mm-hmm. it makes sense that they would change the term from UFO, which has been so mired in parody not being taken seriously that you would give it a new name you'd rebrand it so the something you can take seriously like oh uap that sounds official right that sounds like something that the government would talk about so there's that idea behind that's my conspiracy well, there's also mind the that, idea that if you were trying to take it seriously or maybe you were trying to avoid publicity you can make that argument that you would change the name within these programs so that you get away from the the known nomenclature of ufo to uap no one's going to know what that is until, you know, someone like Hillary Clinton says it on Colbert or whatever. Right, right. You know? Which she did. I figured what program right, it was. It might have been Kimmel or something, but... Uh, UAP. <laughs> okay, so as I said, you have these leaks of these videos in 2017, and the article goes on, in an instant, UFOs were no longer relegated to society's nihilistically curious, which I thought was a weird phrase. Only people interested in UFOs are people who are nihilistically curious. That's paradoxical. Anyway, uh, and for the first time in decades, droves of the mainstream public suddenly found themselves peering skyward with wonder. Well, that's true. Oh. You saw people start talking about this stuff in 2017. Because they were putting out there officially and admitting. Right. People at work are like, oh, did you guys hear there's like, there's actually things going on in the sky? And you're the Pentagon is sharing information. <laughs> you're finally telling us the truth, guys. And you're like, yeah, of course they are. Well, now that CNN like, tells I've me. I've known this my whole life. <laughs> So in these stories, during this time of release of information from the Pentagon or the Pentagon confirming, you had them going back and forth. They made it more confusing because not only did you have these different programs that sounded all the same, like OSWAP, ATIP, which came first, who was in charge, where did this come from? But you also had the DOD saying, yes, Luis Elizondo, who's 
leaking this. He was the head of this program, and the program was for the purposes of looking at unidentified aerial phenomenon. Then they get a new spokeswoman, and she says, no, he wasn't part of the program. And no, no, the intentions of ATIP and OSWAP were not to look at unidentified That's aerial phenomenon. That's the DOD kind of backtracking, muddying the waters, right? right? But in the end, uh, in some consolation to the UFO faithful, the DOD has consistently been willing to say they considered the curious objects shown in the 2017 videos to be unexplained UAP. So I don't know. It's hard to know. Um, what exactly that means, however, has been open for interpretation and debate. So that's, that's kind of where we were. And I think this is the interesting part. And just to wrap up the background, and I'll have links to all the articles I read if you really want to do a deep dive and really build out a picture for yourself. And I think we're going to we're going to make one for the website too, just to help people. A timeline of all these different acronyms. Right, how these projects came to being. But I, the last thing I want to talk about in this kind of stepping back and looking at the bigger picture is the birth of these projects through what I think is a genuine passion to discover what's going on in our weird reality. The connection between UFO phenomenon, cryptid encounters, orbs of light, hauntings, poultry ice activity. High strangeness. And of course, you might have guessed that is going to go back to Bigelow. Skinwalker and Ranch. Skinwalker Ranch. That's where all these things started. All the programs. And you say, can I get some Skinwalker Ranch? What is Sean Connery again? Say it, Chris. Would you like some Skinwalker Ranch? Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sounds like the making of a movie. Yeah, really. I mean, I'm sure there will be one day a real breakdown of everything. Right now, if it is a movie, I feel like we're, we're like in the second act right now. The mm -hmm. third act is on its way. Like we don't know what's coming. And the third act, the final act. Usually. usually. <laughs> I don't know what they do in like Let's, France. But, yeah. I don't know. And now that we have that 180 days till disclosure thing that was put forward uh -huh. in the COVID bill. What's the climax? That's what I was th yeah, thinking when, we were, when you brought this up, John, is that we have that build towards the supposed final release, right? right. Of the, uh, the documents, whatever they're going to be from who, whatever group to the American people. It's weird how it came through the COVID, COVID bill, bill too. It's yeah. just so odd. It it's is like odd. attached to it, like everything else. There are a lot of strange here. aspects to this story and, and where we are right now, I think, and as far as disclosure is concerned. And this is kind of the strange beginning. The path to truly understanding the Pentagon's current UFO problems doesn't begin in 2008 with the Defense Intelligence Agency, or DIA, and the OSWAP, but rather a decade earlier in some 2,000 miles from the nation's capital at the doorstep of a billionaire Nevada entrepreneur, Robert T. Bigelow, the owner of Budget Suites of America and founder of the space technology company Bigelow Aerospace. Now, he's never shied away from amplifying his interest in UFOs. In a 2017 interview, Bigelow told CBS's 60 Minutes he was, quote, absolutely convinced aliens exist, before passionately declaring, quote, I don't give a damn. <laughs> when asked if it was risky to publicly say he believes in UFOs and aliens. In 95, four years before founding his aerospace startup, Bigelow established the National Institute for Discovery Sciences, NITS. From the company's cash website, NITS described itself as a privately funded science institute engaged in research of aerial phenomena, animal mutilations, and other related anomalous phenomena. So it ended up disbanding in 2004. NITS conducted research into a host of various paranormal topics such as cryptid encounters, cattle mutilations, and especially UFOs. The group's most recognized research was the investigation of a purported paranormal Utah homestead owned by Bigelow called Skimwalker Ranch, which would later play a significant role in the DIA's UFO interest. So this is what I was talking about before. We covered the Skimwalker Ranch. I wasn't aware of how this began the other programs at the time. In 2018 interview with New York Magazine, former Nevada Senator Harry Reid told an interesting tale about a curious letter Bigelow received from a senior official from a federal national security agency, quote, I'm interested in talking to you, Mr. Bigelow. I have an interest in what you've been working on. I want to go to your ranch in Utah, Reid recounted. After vetting the letter's author, the individual Reid described as a, quote, very low-key scientist was granted a pass to visit Bigelow's ranch. In a lecture at UFO Megacon in 2019, KLAS reporter George Knapp, what, what? Yeah, told the crowd these events occurred in 2007 and claims the person described by Knapp as a DIA scientist had an experience while visiting the supposed paranormal site. In an interview with the researcher Joe Murgia, former OSWAP, o OSWAP, OSAP, sorry, <laughs> Uh, OSAP contractor and astrophysicist Eric Davis shared what colleagues had told him of the DIA scientist experience. So this is what started the whole thing. This guy, who's a scientist for the Defense Intelligence Agency, had read Knapp's book about Skinwalker Ranch with Bigelow's work there, the secret study that was going on. He read that, and as a scientist from the DIA, he called up Bigelow and he said, Hello, I want to come and see your ranch. I think there's more to this. 
Because at the time he was in charge of the Pentagon's program right. that was investigating aerial phenomenon. And he thought there was more to it than just the nuts and bolts UFOs. He calls up Bigelow and says, Hello, I think there's more to this. There's supernatural aspects to this we don't understand. I heard you the first time. Basically like the Fordian idea or the um, the Keel idea mm -hmm. or the Jacques Vallée he, idea. Isn't the unified, what is it called? There's a name for it, kind of like unified field theory, but it's unified paranormal theory. The idea that everything is kind of the same. Interconnected. Yeah. And we've talked about that a lot on the show. Theory of everything. Kind of, yeah, for like the paranormal. My big toe. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like that, but specifically regarding like Mothman uh, yeah. UFOs. There's a metaphysical aspect to the, an awareness like to this They can't be captured, like they're self-aware and there's a kind of, a, the more you look at it, the more they look back, that whole kind of idea. Yeah. So it's interesting that someone from the DIA also had this sort of spark of reason that there's something more going on here. So he went to Skinwalker Ranch and he had an experience there and this was his experience. In the living room of the former NIDS double wide observation trailer, staff quarters, a 3D object appeared in mid-air in front of him and changed shape like a changing topographical figure. It went from pretzel-shaped to Mobius strip-shaped. It was 3D and multicolored. Then it disappeared. According to Reed, whatever happened at Skinwalker Ranch was enough to convince the DIA to seriously investigate paranormal and UFO phenomenon. Quote, Something should be done about this. Somebody should study it. I was convinced he was right. Reed told New York. So Reed being the senator at the time. Yeah. He was in that movie phenomenon like a mm -hmm. lot. Yeah. Well, he he's friends with Bigelow and they, mm -hmm. they kind of push this. He seems like he genuinely wants to know. Absolutely. Well, it's yeah. like, you know, Kucinich, you know, our yeah, guy, our high right. guy. I think some of these guys, you know, however much the elites at the top, I think a lot of these people are more low level. They have their own passions and beliefs and stuff. Uh -huh. And sometimes they're useful idiots for certain things. But I do think that they do have that capacity for genuine interest and uh -huh. stuff. And oh, yeah, for sure. Can move stuff forward. That was a pretty good film if you haven't seen that phenomenon. Mm -hmm. it, it does a pretty good job of like recounting every yeah. major event in the last 70 or 80 years. And we'll have a few like that linked in the show notes if you really want to do a deeper dive. Because there's so much in this, it's hard to... Yeah. I'm holding my breath as you get through all the acronyms. What is the there? NIDS? The National Institute for Discovery Sciences. Yeah. I wish it was the National Agency of Discovery Science. Nads? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> we're in high school. <laughs> that would be just so funny if you're like, yeah, we're heading over to Nads. That would be, be more fun. <laughs> you to tell us how they came together real quick? So basically, the scientists from the DIA says something needs to be done about this. Talks with Harry Reid. They get this moving in Congress. And eventually, this is kind of how it all comes together. So ATIP was born out of investigations into the Nimitz encounters with the Tic Tac UFO. And then synergy between ATIP and OSWAP, which OSWAP was what was going on at Skinwalker Ranch. The two programs began coordinating. Synergy between these two programs started to take effect. You had this UFO stuff going on with the Nimitz encounter, and then the other side you had this Skinwalker Ranch stuff going on. And um, Bigelow was able to get funding for Bass. Everybody was kind of reporting back to this umbrella and the, the confusion of ATIP and OSAP is still kind of murky, but basically everybody's reporting back to this group to get information to the Pentagon, to the Department of Defense, and to the Defense Intelligence Agency to figure out what's going on, not just with the UFOs and the objects being seen in the sky, but also what's going on with activity places like Skinwalker Ranch. Paranormal phenomena at large. Right, because the people that originated these programs believed that it was all connected. Paranormal activity, UFO activity, even cryptid encounters on some level. So the ranch... It was important enough to include it as a part of the UFO field investigations that the contract required Bass, which was Bigelow's outfit, to implement. The major component was to ascertain UFO threat, the weapons used by UFOs that cause medical injuries, develop predictive pattern to UFO activities to get ahead of them when they appear, predict future advanced military tech that could defend against UFO attacks should that happen, find a way to attempt contact with UFOs and start a dialogue. USAF developed an ET contact protocol in the late 1940s, by the way. Um, and lastly, to find out who or what UFOs are. So that was kind of what Bass was doing, was trying to answer all these questions. What are the health risks of these UFOs that are being seen, this unidentified aerial phenomenon? What are the medical threats that are coming along with this? How do we protect against these things? And lastly, the DIA is an intelligence agency, so its mission is to discover the UAP's plans and operations via intelligence collection and analysis to protect the national security, allegedly. 
the OSAP was to provide data to assist the ATIPS Nimitz and Roosevelt investigation. So that's kind of how it all connects. And if that sounds convoluted, it's because it kind of is, but we'll have it all broken down for you. Listeners, just back up and listen to that five more times. <laughs> I really thought I'm going to clarify this for people. Basically, I just want to sum it up by saying people who started these programs were people who were fascinated with not just UFOs, but the connection to paranormal activity. They were able to get people interested who were in positions of power to develop these programs and convince people at places like the Department of Defense and the Defense Intelligence Agency to spearhead these investigations and help coordinate these different governmental bodies. And why wouldn't they if they could use that information too? Exactly. So not necessarily to say that this disclosure if it does come at all, is from a benevolent place necessarily, but the origins are. The origins of the movement, at least on the public face of it, the people who started it, I think were trying to do something good for the people of the world. Well, let's take a quick break, and when we get back, we're going to talk about where it's going next and maybe some of the other side of that coin. germs we are back welcome all right to get to what inspired this episode i think what compelled us to do it was this pyramid sighting and along with it these other strange objects that were cited recently and confirmed by the pentagon um and by the way that phrase pentagon confirms pyramid ufo you read the same headline basically in every publication and if you read these articles there really wasn't much information in there but luckily the people that brought the original story george knapp and jimmy corbell on his site as well That's where you get the details. So that's where we're going to be reading from is George Knapp's article here related to this this recent disclosure. And, you know, of course, they broke the story. Did you want to say something, Jerry? Yeah, I was just going to say in the notes, this will be the show notes too, guys. Just an example. I put side by side CNN and People Magazine. I mean, People Magazine, right, it's supposed to be a far cry from CNN, both taking this topic very seriously. And it just goes to show that idea of kind of the singular mind of the media, what can we say about this? How should we present this with what seriousness? And it's interesting to me because it always used to be the opposite. It used to be the opposite. You used to have, you know, X-Files music playing behind every UFO sighting that's reported in the news. And now it's this, you know, waiting with bated breath, you know, on mm-hmm. the edge of your seat kind of, I, you know, CNN anchors like, wow, this is really happening kind of feeling. It's interesting, this shift. And I don't think it's accidental. I think that there, I mean, my personal opinion is that there's a purpose behind it and a certain, um, control of the dissemination of the information what what if it's real what if it's not and maybe mixing those two right we'll get into that but yeah and and getting back to the whole like x-files music thing still even though the sort of framing has changed where it used to be like oh you know more spooky molders out there saying yeah with x-files stuff now it's uh maybe the truth is out there and you know like i want to believe jenny they still use the same cliched you know but now they're framing it in a way that like now we're allowed to say like maybe this is a legit phenomenon which is silly they should have been saying it for years. But let's hear this one, huh? Yeah, let's hear this. So this comes from George Knapp's website, Mystery Wire, and it's a fantastic resource if you really want to just go down a rabbit hole of kind of figuring out how this all interplays with, with itself. Okay, here we go. Military and intelligence officials say they remain baffled by unusual, unidentified aircraft that have been encountered in recent years off both coasts of the United States. Many of the objects have been referred to as drones, but that is not what Pentagon investigators have been telling the chain of command behind the scenes. Naval Air Station Oceana is the center of air power on the east coast of the United States. It is a sprawling naval air station in Virginia, home to the best aviators in the world. Since at least 2014, F-18 pilots flying into the zone designated W-72 have reported encounters with a bizarre array of unknown, unidentified objects and aircraft positioned directly in their daily flight paths. 
Investigators with the Pentagon's UAP task force have requested that airmen try to document their encounters. On March 4, 2019, one of them did. An F-18 weapons system officer seated behind the pilot used his iPhone to capture images of three different objects he encountered in the same airspace. At 3.02 p.m., he photographed an odd-shaped object. Another photo taken close to the same time was first posted to Twitter on May 11, 2020, and then again on social media six months later. Other photos taken on the same day, March 4, 2019, have never been made public until now. The object, the Navy calls the sphere, was photographed at 2.44 p.m. The second one to be photographed was dubbed the acorn. Then 12 minutes later, the WSO spotted a third object described as the metallic blimp. It appears to have various appendages. Isn't that pretty crazy looking? That's the one that every outlet I read didn't mention the appendages, but when you zoom in, you can see it almost looks like a... Uh, could it uh, just be a blimp? Star Trek, uh, no. What are they called? Um, no. no. Shuttlecraft? Shuttlecraft yeah. from Star Trek. It's got like the two arms on the sides. It looks like a little Covenant ship from Halo or something. Right. Well, to answer your question, no, it could be a blimp because it looks like a Banshee. Sorry, Banshee from Halo. That's what it's like. <laughs> right. Man, I missed that game. Uh, this airspace, this W-72 airspace, it's being completely monitored by the the Navy presence that's in right. that area. So they know what's going on. They have these sensors. They're watching these things. They know that they're there and then they're not there. The pilots take these pictures. They know there were no blimps in the area, nothing like that. These objects weren't drones. They, in high winds, would stay stationary. Okay. Mystery Wire first learned of the photos exactly two years ago during a private briefing hosted by Mr. Bigelow himself, Robert, and several <laughs> others in Las Vegas on Saturday, <laughs> April 6th, 2019. Speculation at the time was that the objects might be foreign spy drones, possibly Chinese, which seems kind of like a possibility. Yeah, for sure. And we've learned the Navy wanted to snag one, meaning capture it for study. That never happened. Critics tried to explain away the objects. Several people online compared the acorn to a toy Batman balloon. It looks just like it, actually. That's weird. Kinda, yeah. But two years later, after careful study of the UAP task force, what if it was Batman? <laughs> like actually Batman? Yeah. <laughs> like from the Marvel Universe, if that's even... DC, bro. Sorry. <laughs> Not a comic person. But two years later, after careful study by the UAP task force, the objects remained unidentified. Although these three did not perform spectacular maneuvers like the famed Tic Tac or Gimbal UFOs recorded elsewhere, they do not behave like any drones or balloons known to the U.S. military. Mystery Wire has learned of sensitive briefings prepared by UAP task force and delivered to multiple military and intelligence audiences. The task force reports noted that the objects were able to remain stationary in high winds with no movement beyond the capability of known balloons or drones. Earlier this week, Chief of Naval Operations Michael Gilday was questioned by reporters about naval encounters on the West Coast. Swarms of so-called drones buzzed Navy warships in July 2019, a few months after the East Coast photographs were taken. The Admiral said, information has been collected and analyzed, but the objects have defied explanation. In March, the former National Intelligence Director John Ratcliffe told Fox News that he was one of many top officials to be briefed on the mystery craft. Quote, We are talking about objects that have been seen by Navy or Air Force pilots or have been picked up by satellite imagery that frankly engage in actions that are difficult to explain. Movements that are hard to replicate that we don't have the technology for are traveling at speeds that exceed the sound barrier without a sonic boom. That's a key thing there, without the sonic boom. Like you hear this in these encounters all the time with this unidentified aerial phenomena where they're traveling, you know, Mach 2, 3, 4. They don't follow the laws of physics. Exactly, or their own, their own physics. And that when it, we're talking about that spherical craft that there's an image of in this in this article that's been released, they refer to it as a transmedium vehicle mm. because it enters the water. <laughs> You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Dear? Yeah. Is that interesting? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to follow up the balloon thing. I thought it was interesting. I'm going to get a pretzel. Tell me again, Chris. The sphere they, is seen going into the water. Oh, went under the water. Sorry. 
Sorry, I missed that. So you're saying that this sphere went underwater, so it's transmedium. It can go between exactly. the air and water. So that, to me, would point to the idea, if it's non-human, that it could be an under potentially an underground civilization. Right. In, right? This, in this briefing, in this pamphlet, which is basically where this information came from that was given to Corbell, leaked to Corbell, and, and Knapp was this pamphlet that detailed these different accounts. Because right. where this all came from was a pamphlet or it was some sort of document that was given to personnel to inform them on the UAP presence and what they can do, the capabilities of these craft. Oh. This was one of the examples they gave in this pamphlet. Here's an example of a transmedium UAP that is seen by an Air Force pilot and then enters the water, much like that pencil in the John's mouth. Just like that, transmedium. <laughs> Basically to say these things, they're not only flying in the sky, these things can fly from the air to underwater. Right. So watch below. And another important thing to underline here is that these three craft- like Jaws. These three craft that are seen space jaws in this experience <laughs> with this circular thing and this blimp thing with the appendages that Batman maybe a balloon. Uh, but regardless if that one's a balloon or not, you have these three things that are all seen by the same pilot taking pictures of this in the same time frame on mm -hmm. the same day within a very short period of time. It's just fascinating. Yeah, I'd like to get through okay, this sorry. article. Finish your article. Thank you. God, swallow your pretzel. Oh, I heard it. Don't be don't be weird. <laughs> okay. The so-called drone swarms that buzz Navy destroyers in 2019 have been further documented in articles by The Drive, which obtained ship logs describing the weird incursions. Those encounters appeared in the same general area as the 2004 Tic Tac UFO, which was pursued by former Navy commander Dave Friver. Mystery Wire has reached out to the Pentagon for comment on these images and will update this story if needed. Update. Well done. The Pentagon did respond Friday, April 9th, for a request to comment on the images and video. A Pentagon spokesperson sent Mystery Wire the following statement. Quote, I can confirm that the reference photos and videos were taken by Navy personnel. The UAPTF has included these incidents in their ongoing examinations, as we have said before, to maintain operation security and to avoid disclosing information that may be useful to potential adversaries. DOD does not discuss publicly the details of either the observations or the examinations of reported incursions into our training ranges or designated airspace, including those incursions initially designated as UAP. Right, which is unidentified aerial phenomenon. That was from Susan Goff, Pentagon spokesperson. So she's the latest of the spokespeople, kept changing the story. So you're right, Joe, that article does not go into the pyramid sighting, but it came from the same source material. It came from the same briefing pamphlet that's given to the Navy personnel looking at the UAP phenomenon. And within that is the pyramid. I want pyramid. All right. All right, you're going to get it. Thank you. No, it is interesting, and we're going to look at the show notes. I think the Batman balloon theory is mm -hmm. interesting when it comes to the acorn. Right. Uh, we'll link to Black Vault. Uh, John Greenberg did kind of an interesting video on that. That blimp though, man. That blimp. Okay, the blimp is interesting. It looks like a shuttlecraft. It is it is interesting. Are you talking about the one we just looked at? Yeah. One of those three. The, mm. the blimp one I think is the most fascinating. It looks alien. Yeah. John Greenberg's argument about the acorn and being the Batman balloon, there's a comparison he does that someone else put forth but he presented. Right. And he used it as part of an older theory that's been going on, which we have already kind of touched on a little bit, this idea that if you if you know a truth and you want people to think that you are not hiding the truth, you act as if you don't know the truth. And you say, well, we really don't know what this is. We want your help, American people. Help us identify. And then you put out stuff that could be so easy to identify like the Batman balloon, right? Versus the acorn ship, that comparison. Right. If, if it is just a balloon, it's easy enough that a person within an hour can figure that out once it goes national. And then you mix that with potential real- You're talking about murking up secret, the water. Secret tech. Yeah. Exactly. You're murking up the water, murking it. Yeah. That's a good uh, good theory, I think, that he had. So that's a good point. But it doesn't discount the reality of potential advanced craft in the sky. It just, it discounts the narrative that the government is saying, well, we're giving you all the information. We're verifying these are all true. Because he points to a document that shows that they had knowledge about certain sightings being a balloon. Right. And they let people believe that they didn't know. Yeah. So, I mean, you know what I mean? It's, it does muddy the waters. It's Absolutely. An interesting theory. No, I, I definitely think that's, a, I mean, if you wanted to mislead people and you wanted to discredit some potentially authentic UAP footage and photography, then you would mix in a Batman balloon. Right, exactly. You know, because then you can point to that. You know, it's like the straw man, you know? Right, a baby out with the bathwater. Right. All right, let's get some pyramid action going, Chris. Okay, so over on Corbell's site, 
the filmmaker who did the Bob Lazar film, who has been kind of the lead at divulging this recent confirmed stuff from the Pentagon uh, with George Knapp. Um, it was leaked to him in the first place. And the pyramid, so the pyramid, it's funny, if you read these articles that talk about the pyramid crafts over the U.S. ship being confirmed by the Pentagon, they don't go into detail much about what happened, even where it was located, what was the ship, what ship was it, this kind of stuff. If you go to Corbell site, you can get a little more information and in this series, in the briefing, when they talk about the pyramid crafts that go overhead, said it was an event series described that involves the USS Russell. Right. And the UAP event series took place during July of 2019 involving Strike Group 9 within the warning areas of San Diego, which we mentioned that piece of ocean there. Sounds like a dangerous place. Apparently. This is one of those hotspots that's been, you know, right. over and over again. Strike area. The USS Russell observed and recorded multiple quote, pyramid-shaped craft. And we'll have these images and video in the show notes. Observations of this encounter series were noted in detail within this pamphlet that was leaked to these guys. And then later, the Pentagon has confirmed. And side note, did you explain to people who these guys are that are the special team that are taking pictures of these craft? Because I thought that was interesting. Oh, like in the submarine, for instance, or the USS Russell, was it a destroyer or a submarine? There is a task, right? A special task force that basically their job, if I'm remembering this right, basically their job is when there's something flying outside that they don't know what it is, these guys run upstairs on deck with their phones and take pictures and video. So what you're referring to is called a Snoopy team? Snoopy team. Is that what it is? They get activated to run up with like (laughs) prosumer cameras. What you're remembering is when I was talking about the Channel Island incident which is not this incident, but which when we read about what they kept calling drones, Uh they would come back for three nights, these these lights that would buzz over nuclear ships and float above helicopter pads on this. And this is a whole other incident we're not going to cover, but we'll have in the show notes. But this happened over a series of three nights. There were multiple ships involved, nuclear warships. This encounter, the USS Russell is a Arleigh Burke class destroyer in the United States. Okay, but it is a Snoopy team that took Imagery. No, no, no. This, these, these <laughs> photos. <laughs> it's not a Snoopy team. It's not a Snoopy team. Funny. These photos were taken by Strike Group Nine. Okay. So yeah, I guess it would have been Snoopy. T- yeah, because they were people on they board were the se- ship, seamen. Right. Yeah. That lived inside the they ship. Basically notified, like, yeah, we have something out here, Come and they take climb pictures. out because that's that's their like side job within their naval job, right? Let's go take pictures of anomalous activity up top. It's part of their part of the job. Yeah. That'd be a sweet job. Interesting. So what are people seeing in this video? For those that haven't looked at our video yet on our show So in this video, you have these people on board, this destroyer-class ship. It's night vision, right? Night vision, looking up at the sky, and you see what is, at first just seems to be a flashing pyramid shape in the sky. So here's the video. We'll give a description as we're playing it here. Looking up in the sky, you see a piece of the ship there. There's a little pole coming up. Yeah, right past it is a flashing triangle shape. And then you can see faintly behind it two more that aren't flashing. They're just quietly in the dark. You start to see it pass one of the craft, pass over the other one. If you slow this down, if you zoom in, you can actually make out a 3D shape of a pyramid shape. First time I saw it, I didn't realize it was a pyramid structure. But once you pause it and, and blow up that image, and we'll have that in the show notes, you can see that there is indeed a three-dimensional aspect to it. Even the one behind it seems to turn. Is it pulsing or is that just yeah. reflection? No, it's pulsing. It's pulsing really? light. Oh, weird. Just one of them. That's the other thing. And yeah. it's funny because I always used to look up in the sky so and I would see something strange, like moving in a very strange way. I'm like, it can't be a UFO. I mean, it can't be a extraterrestrial craft because it's blinking. And I always thought that meant it had to be an airplane. Right. Apparently they blink. What's weird about that, what kind of makes me feel like it's not military, like from another country, it just doesn't seem like within our physical reality, what you would build, right. like the shape of anything that would be like advanced. Right. It does seem like off world, like some other, unless they got their technology from off world, but it doesn't look like a high tech craft. Well, yeah, it's, I mean, first of all, it's a pyramid shape Yeah. and there, there's no signs of propulsion. There's no sound of propulsion. Um, the light is interesting. It's again, it's not like a light on it is flashing. The, the whole entire thing, thing is flashing. Yeah, it almost looks like a like if you had a mirror far away and you were shining it and hitting the sun. That's yeah. what it Dude, looks it's like. Dude, it's so fun. This is so funny because 
a lot of the accounts that I found corroborating it from MUFON and stuff, this database where people report their own sightings. Mm -hmm. I have multiple accounts, a couple of them coming up, where they describe seeing a metallic pyramid hovering in the sky that's reflecting sunlight. Mm -hmm. Multiple accounts say that it's like sheet metal. Oh, interesting. Is that what that could be doing? Because that's kind of what it looks like. I I don't know where it'd be reflecting from, but it definitely could be reflecting if it's not self-illuminating. It seems like pretty regular flashing, though. But if it's moving back and forth and it's hitting... It just the way it's operating seems that's more likely what it is. Cause I guess so. It's it's not quite regular. The flashes it's somewhat irregular. And uh, Mick West, that guy from Metabunk, I was talking about. He uh, his debate about it was to say that uh, the flight seemed similar to FAA compliant lights on normal airplanes. And his argument essentially is that using where the stars are positioned, yada yada, and assuming that it's about thirty three thousand feet up where a plane would be, it would be about the size of a plane. So you're kind of assuming that it's that's the height that it's at, but assuming that it's that height it is going the speed that a plane would be going. And his argument about the shape is that you know how like sometimes a camera, if it's not focused, will blur lights into a kind of a shape. His argument is that it, some cameras have a, tr- a oh, tri- triangular iris, and so that light and the lights behind it, they're all just planes, and the lights are blurred, and so it looks like one that's object. That's that's but if you case. zoom, if you actually pay attention and you look close, like you said, the frame by frame, you look at the craft itself. You can see it kind of shift, it looks like, and you can make out a back shadow, like a, a depth to it that is pyramidal. Right. That doesn't make sense if it's just a blurry light. It also, it seems like a very lazy analysis because that triangular shape, when it's not blinking, is still a triangle. So if it's the flare of the light causing the right. camera to see it as a triangle. Well, that's an interesting point. It's, it's, um, it's always that shape, even when it's not illuminated. The man that doesn't want to accept the reality right. that we're being visited. Even behind it. By alien. Interestingly, exactly. George Knapp. He's a sad, scared little man. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know Mick West personally, Might but be a nice guy. I'm uh, joking. I don't even know who you're talking about. But he is a sad, scared <laughs> little man. He runs Metabunk. Oh, that's what's funny is the New York Post article referred to him as a quote renowned UFO investigator. He runs <laughs> Metabunk. His job He's is a professional to, skeptic. Yeah, it's called wordsmithing. Yeah, he is technically a UFO investigator, but it's always his purpose is to discredit. And you could argue that on those on the other side, just you know, using language to manipulate people, right? And New York Post, they usually have some, I think, some fair. Yeah, coverage. they actually did a really good um, web series on breaking all the stuff down. That's actually really well done, and by a guy who believes in the stuff. So, interestingly, thirty years before this took place in 1991, George Knapp was on scene in Moscow. And oh, yeah, cover this. Another pyramid. Above was it the Kremlin? What? Thirty years ago? Hovering over that, a highly sensitive area. That didn't occur thirty years ago. It was during this release of documents from the KGB. And this is one of those craft that had been classified for really? decades. I thought it actually happened over in ninety one. It wasn't ninety one. No, no, he he covered it in ninety one okay. because it had just been released, but it happened in like the sixties or fifties. Really? Yeah. But it it's looks it, like again, the exact it's a pyramid. Same thing. Exactly. Even more you can even see more three dimensionality in this Russian image, which we'll have in the show notes. Pretty amazing. Oh, it was in the nineteen seventies. Okay, yeah. But yeah, that I mean that is absolutely a tetrahedral mm-hmm. kind of shape. Right. Yeah. And the fact that it was classified information from the KGB, from the Russian government, it was investigated. It wasn't something that was a hoax, or there was something they concluded to be not unknown. It was an unknown. It's interesting if that is, I mean, what does that say? You know, it it's says like, that the pyramids in Egypt are alien constructions and they're probably just waiting to take off. Stargate. It is funny to think about how many pyramids there are around the world, what connections this might have to ancient Earth. Pyramid is definitely one of those mysterious shapes. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> yeah, and people claim that you can grow things in pyramids and oh, you yes. grow plants that's a fascinating idea yeah that i think in in the soviet union they something were, about the structure they were growing seeds in pyramidal shapes uh-huh. to basically produce a result 10 50 times larger than regular i think they have like grow. healing acoustic yeah and there's so that, much with pyramids that are in pyramid shape i think all, all kinds of ideas it's god's favorite shape is that why everything in our world is built is like squares and rectangles oh to keep our, our consciousness subdued <laughs> right, yeah <laughs> maybe that is one argument it wouldn't be that surprising really i mean how much cooler would everything be if it was all kind of like oh my pyramid? god it'd be so much better <laughs> so you said you found other corroborating accounts of pyramid shapes reported to mufon and new fork right yeah so this is what what i wanted to get into so i do have some information coming up about operation mockingbird the kind of misinformation the way that the cia has used the media and that could be being done today with the way that they're disseminating the information and kind of controlling the narrative. That's coming up. But before we do that, there are some pretty fun pyramid stories that I found that do corroborate. We can go through a few of them here. If we don't have time for all of them, I'll put them in the notes. Maybe we'll do some in the expansion because they're they're pretty crazy. And here is the breakdown. So as I went through these, and I, 
I uh, aggregated these from New Fork and MUFON using the keyword pyramid. Nice. And here are some of the repeating characteristics. We got a lot of them being orange or amber in color or having amber or orange lights. Um, interestingly, flying on its side. Right, which in that video is the same thing. It's a pyramid flying on its side. Yeah. Which makes it look like the, the longer triangle. Exactly. So there are accounts of them hovering either point up or point down, but mostly flying sideways on its long face. Um, hovering, spinning is a common trait. Yeah. So creepy to see that in the sky. A spinning pyramid. Black spinning pyramid. Right. Yeah, hovering in the sky. Um, silent or low hum, just over treetops above your neighbor's house, right? That's mm-hmm. got to be terrifying. Yeah. But that's coming up. One of the fascinating things is lightning is seen. Either right at the point of exiting the encounter area or immediately after a lightning storm would come in. Like there's some interaction. And, you know, William Reich, who made Orgon, John, Mm -hmm. he believed that UFOs were here stealing our Orgon energy. Mm. We talked about him in the sky. I'm glad I have an Orgon defender. Right? See, they might be coming for you, Jonathan. You have an Orgon defender? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, am I going to decide to lie? (laughs) I do. What is an Orgon defender? The block of Orgon, right? The block of Orgon. Does it, it keeps orgone away or it's a, no, a defender made of orgone? It's a defender made of orgone. Protects oh. you from like ELF radiation, stuff yeah. like that? Protects me from little gremlins that uh, <laughs> hover over my bedroom at night. I want one of those. <laughs> you never be too careful. Uh, and finally, there's an odd attraction to golf courses, which we'll see here. Weird. Ooh, golf yeah, courses are beautiful. Mm-hmm. Four. Watch it, bub. John, I want you to do this one. Certainly. Our first story. This fella uh, submitted the story from The Colony in Texas, which by itself sounds like a... Uh, <laughs> <It's> a cult? <laughs> uh, sounds pretty compound? Yeah, it sounds like a UFO recruiter's compound or something. Um, Have you been to The Colony yet? <laughs> very, very aggressive. I titled this, Over My Neighbor's House Every Night. This is from New Fork, right? Yeah, this story, all these stories come from New Fork. From the colony. Guys, there were so many that I didn't even get to the MUFON ones. These are just, really? these are just a selection. A pyramid craft. Dude, there's like 30 to 40 that I found, so we'll have them on the sh- on the they website. They are out there! I saw one in Texas. Was there a pyramid? Could have been a pyramid. It was a triangle. So it could have been just one face of it. There are the delta-shaped black wing-looking triangles. TR3B. I think that's a separate thing. I think those are military. Yeah. Not to say what you okay, saw was Story wasn't. time. Do it. Every night I go to my backyard, smoke my cigarettes with my binoculars for a few hours at night. And I finally start catching multiple almost like cloaked triangle shaped, one bright red light at the peak and two white lights following the other points. Be moving very slowly. Tonight, finally clear night sky, no clouds. And I got a good look at the two UFOs. Triangle cloak only with three lights and it seems to be rotation formation. Like a 3D pyramid rotating while both crafts are moving away from one another. But what I can't stop thinking about, how there was a freaking spinning cloaked pyramid (laughs) just above my neighbor's tree line. I was completely mesmerized by the rotating of the craft. Just had my eyes glued to my scopes and watched it almost like a glossy style, like one of those colored prisms. Every night they are out there just hovering around the town. Wonder if they notice me, noticing them. (laughs) <laughs> Pretty crazy, huh? Perfect voice for that story, though. Yeah, it sounds a lot like that rush of the spinning, the pyramid uh-huh. spinning. Again, weird. It really does start to sound like there's something to not just the Pentagon confirmed pyramid video, but also that this is something that's been going on for a long time. I was so psyched when I heard this about the pyramid thing. I just, you know, New Fork and, and um, MUFON are such great resources just to find raw data of people's yeah. encounters. So unsolicited. Right. So scrubbing those and finding ones that correlate, it was just such an op- awesome opportunity, if I'm being frank, just just to see if there was anything else out there. Yeah. And I think that it's fascinating that there have been, since going back, I mean, I think the earliest one I have is from 2006. Um, I'm not sure if the site goes back further, New Fork specifically, but there weren't any listings that I saw beyond that from the ones that I'd grabbed, this, right. this selection here. All right, this next one's creepy. Chris, if you want to read this one. You mentioned earlier about there being, uh, that group was formed. One of the questions they were trying to answer was, are there health concerns with this kind of advanced tech? Right. This guy drives through one. Awesome. Has some consequences. Oh, not awesome. All right. Let's read his story. It's interesting. This is a relatively recent encounter. Driving through the craft. Okay. This happened in fertile Minnesota. 
May 2nd, 2019. I was traveling south on Highway 102 on my way to Fertile, Minnesota. As soon as I came to the intersection to turn on Highway 41, I saw an object in the distance in the middle of the highway about seven miles from me. The object had two bright orb-style lights that were very large. As I approached the object, the top of it started changing colors, kind of like a jellyfish. Sky well much? Oh yeah, wow, weird. I then started to get very close to the object and realized the light did not make any reflection. It was iridescent. Then I proceeded to drive under the object at about 30 miles an hour. As I passed under it, I could see the outline of the massive craft. This was a very large UFO that did not make any noise, which was very, very strange to me. After I passed it on the highway, it disappeared. The next few days, I was extremely ill and could not hold any food down. These resulted in me losing 12 pounds. Well, yeah, that's something we've heard before. Mm -hmm. Radiation burns. Right. Um, was Kecksburg, was that one where there was a, some kind of radiation poisoning? Or I know Betty and Barney Hill, there were consequences that were later recalled during hypnotic regression. I think Aurora, too. I think that supposed craft that crashed in like the early 1900s that poisoned the well or something and they end up having... Some kind of disease. Uh, you get a lot of accounts like that in, in our expansion when we do the the schoolyard UFO encounters. I mean, there's examples of children going up close to this craft, touching the craft, screaming, running away, being taken away in hospital, never being seen again. So, and that, that's going to be a fun episode. We'll be doing that in the expansion. Let's let's quick fire a couple more of these stories All here. Right. Um, let's do. Uh, these things were rolling. This is a pretty unique description, and this came from uh, Diamond Bar, California. July 20th, 2012, and you're riding along when you see this thing with your girlfriend. My girlfriend and I saw a two-story pyramid with bright lights rolling up hill on Grand Avenue in Diamond Bar, California. Weird. While returning home from the dental office near Grand and Diamond Bar Boulevard in Diamond Bar, California, my girlfriend and I saw a strange lighted object approaching. We had just pulled out of our parking space. My girlfriend drove. And as she drove towards the main street, we noticed an object brightly lit up, rolling up the hillside. What? Excited, my girlfriend parked the car in order to take a picture. The object stopped right in front of us and hovered for approximately 30 seconds. The object was shaped like a pyramid, but the top was flat. There were lights on all four corners, one white, one blue, one red, and one amber. The object had a large bubble in the center, and the object seemed to roll around it. I also noticed that the object had a mask on. <laughs> it was practicing social distancing. <laughs> it was practicing social distancing. I also noticed what looked like air vents and a couple of access panels of sorts. The object was approximately two stories high, what? and it was gold in color, or so it seemed to take on the color of the sun. Now we're both outside the car and she's trying to take the picture with her cell phone. The object stopped directly behind some trees that had been trimmed recently and right next to a condo complex on Grand Avenue. Unable to get a clear picture, my girlfriend and I thought the object attempted to avoid us taking a photo. Just as she snapped the shutter, the object proceeded to roll back down the hill towards Diamond Bar Boulevard. We got back in the car and made the right turn down Grand Avenue to Diamond Bar Boulevard. I kept my eye on the optic as it changed direction and rolled away behind the shopping center. I at first thought to follow and see if I could possibly get a better shot at a picture, but the object began to pull away at a rapid rate of speed. We told ourselves not to say anything, but I can't seem to stop seeing it in my dreams each night. Weird. Plus, this isn't my first sighting, but let's let that go. Oh. <laughs> Red flag. I'm a man of many skills. <laughs> what? I could build my own aircraft and I know what a weather balloon looks like. This one was too big to be a radio control craft as well. Weird. Yeah. That tag at the end is always a little suspect when you're like, I'm a man of many it skills. It sounds like he might have been joking, but a little tongue in cheek. It sounds like he was trying to say like, I know what I'm looking yeah. at because I, I, I also I build remote aircraft. Um, that's crazy if that's, I mean, it's so odd. A pyramid rolling up a hill. Sounds like a weird dream. Yeah. And the, the one thing that does correlate is that there are so many of these where they're seen, like I, we won't get to all these, maybe save some for the hotel, or for the hotel, for the expansion. You're going on a trip? No, but there are multiple here that are seen like outside of hotel windows hovering. Interesting. Over golf courses, 
low-lying areas. These things are seen before they slowly either back up and then shoot off in a space where they just slowly retreat well, and over the horizon. Here's the other thing, broad daylight. This took yeah. place during the daytime. A lot of them did. So did the, obviously the images were taken of those three, the, the sphere and the blimp and the Batman balloon maybe, the acorn, broad daylight. Yeah. Like if these things are, you know, what we think that they are, it's pretty brazen. And again, I'm not sure about the pyramids. You know, it looks like night vision. I'm not 100% sure that happened at night. It might be daytime with the infrared scope. So don't quote me on that. We know that this is happening often enough in broad daylight that it could have been a broad daylight encounter. I'm not sure on that. I have to double check that. So a lot of these here have the features we talked about, like the metal reflecting sunlight. Uh, these seem to be attributes of this. We're going to have more of these in the show notes. And like I said, we might do some of these in expansion. We're going to read one last one here because I wanted to jump back and just finish this off with some the question of uh, influence in the media, which I think is really interesting, um, just to tie this all together in a story. But yeah, let's read this. This, this one's a little more fun. And there are, I don't want to not take this seriously because there are a lot of really just solid encounters, even some so mundane, like saw pyramid and sky move from east to west at right. 60 miles an hour Nothing or whatever. sensational. Right, other than the fact that it's a giant floating black pyramid. Right. So this one's called The Floating Black Pyramid Exists. I woke up to a strange this light. This comes from Union City, California. Say that again because I was talking. This comes from Union City, California, February 6, 2006. I woke up to a strange light on my chest and began to faint right when I woke up. Looking at the footboard, there were three figures that I knew were solid, real, physical, in the room life forms. When I woke up, I ran to the backyard and looked at the sky, and there it was a black pyramid. Floating in the sky and was moving very slow, as in the form of flying and floating. Since it didn't zip through the sky, I watched it until it floated over the horizon. Then I ran into the house and went to my room listening to the sound of silence. Nothing made noise, and it had seemed that the entire planet was asleep until I realized that it was sneaking over the horizon with the sounds of screams breaking out and the pyramid deflecting the sounds until it was quiet. In my room, hoping I was unnoticed, when a running transparent life form wrestled me... What? What? A running transparent life form wrestled with me until I was able to grab a knife and fought until it ran away. I was injured when I went to stab it and lost control of the knife and it got lodged in my kneecap. Bandaging my wound, I went to the front yard without waking anyone up in my house since I hoped that my house was under their radar and being the witness of a probable vessel had just passed by there was no compromising my family since I don't know how well the recovery would have been. Hmm? Well, that stretches your yeah. belief a little bit. Opening the front door, I witnessed a red helicopter pulling a rope up and then it flew away. Moving back into the house, my parents walked up to me, looked at me, and said I need to go to the hospital since I looked crazy to them. However, I didn't want to tell them what had just happened since something could and possibly would have caused harm. At the hospital, I was given a pill, which put me to sleep, and I declined to openly speak to people about it since I believe there is reason to respectfully remain silent until a professional approaches to prove the floating black pyramid exists. Wait, so is he crazy? I mean, this one sounds a sounds little... Sounds like he might be schizophrenic. This is one of the earliest ones I found on the database, and obviously it's, it's quite a story. Well, that last line there is kind of interesting, where he says... Respectfully remain silent until a professional approaches to prove the floating black pyramids exist. It's just interesting because I know this is this is definitely a cra- I wouldn't necessarily believe this one right off the bat. Um, it's I'm pretty skeptical about it. Obviously, it's interesting, but it is interesting that he, this is like the first encounter I found, and it says he's waiting for people to prove they exist. And now there's all these subsequent stories right. about black pyramids in the sky, and then now the DoD is saying it's true. So either he's just like a hoaxer that got real lucky, or some maybe or somebody mentally crazy. imbalanced. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe something did happen that's something similar to his story. Right. Who knows? I thought that was a pretty crazy one. Yeah, we'll have more stories in the show notes, and we might do some of these in the expansion, because uh, they are fascinating, and it's pretty colorful, some of them. But I just wanted to wrap this up here for you guys with uh, the idea of the potential misinformation campaign with Operation Mockingbird. Well, let's take a quick break before that, and then when we get back, we'll get into this. Cool.
Hello. Welcome back. All right, let's play a little bit of bedrock foundation for the idea that there could be some influence in the media. We know that there is. It's on record. Yeah. Uh, in the form of Operation Mockingbird. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with this concept, in the 70s, there was a report done, a select Senate committee called the Church Committee that was basically tasked with reporting on the potential unconstitutional activities of the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, and the IRS, basically going outside of their purview. Now, what ended up happening was that it found incriminating evidence against the New York Times, CBS, Reuters, AP, Newsweek, Times, and more that were all involved with these organizations, specifically the CIA. Wow, so like CIA assets in all yeah. these news organizations. That's not that surprising. So let me break this down a little bit. So published in 1976, the committee's report had confirmed earlier stories that charged the CIA had cultivated relationships with private institutions, including the press. It found 50 journalists who had official but secret relationships with the CIA. Then, in 1977, Rolling Stone magazine article called The CIA and the Media expounded upon the church committee's report and said that around 400 press members were considered assets by the CIA. That's crazy, man. That's a lot. And especially at a time when, I mean, there were different news organizations, maybe not as conglomerized, but not what we have now. Yeah, because back then you had way fewer news outlets. So to have 400 members of the press... Well, basically everyone. Or say, <laughs> in every major news organization, yeah. there were you know, AP. Well, I'm sure it's gotten better since then. Well, the, oh, that's okay, that's the question. More right? assets, so, too. So Operation Mockingbird was never officially confirmed as the title, but in 2007, around 700 pages of documents were declassified and released by the CIA in a collection called The Family Jewels. Ooh. These files all surrounded the investigations and scandals pertaining to agency misconduct during the 1970s. So this included the involvement with the media, but also other issues. Agency being the CIA? Yeah, the CIA. In these documents, there's only one mention of Operation Mockingbird, but that's of what they released. So the argument is this program was widespread. There's testimony, and we're going to hear a clip here in a second, a really short clip, where you actually get to hear some of that meeting where they're they're admitting to this kind of influence. And the idea that it's not going on now, like the CIA would just <laughs> right. give up such a successful program. Now it seems so obvious. And initially it wasn't aimed internally. It was aimed at uh, foreign intelligence. Yeah, and, and foreign media to sway popular media about communism and stuff like that. But over time, the idea obviously is it's that- It's all practice for right now. Exactly. I mean, if these major networks are getting these stories, like one guy had submitted 600 stories or something like that, and he was the CIA asset to the major news groups that carried it. All of the people in the United States reading these stories, it's obviously going to sway opinion, not just internationally, but and in, in the idea that that could be easily be turned inward. Right. And then you have the accusations, John, like you mentioned earlier about the term conspiracy theorist being developed by the CIA. And I've heard that in connection with Operation Mockingbird. Haven't found that exact right. point of evidence yeah, yet. Couldn't find it. If any of you guys out there know where that's actually documented, we'd love to see that. But um, I would not be surprised at all. Well, they definitely use the term for any time they just want to shut down the conversation. Oh, something yeah. Something that doesn't go along with whatever narrative they're pushing. Right. It just turns people's brain off when you say, oh, that's a conspiracy theory. People just, in me, like, it's just a program. As if response. those don't exist anyway, you know? I mean, people conspire every day about all kinds of things. And you think in this world, powerful people don't ever get together to conspire against people's best interests. Exactly. Like, I'm sure it happens all the time. We didn't have conspiracies. We wouldn't have classified documents. Right. The idea that you're That's keeping information back from people and you're- Conspiracy to prevent information getting out. Yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Sorry. I was just going to say, it's when I even read it in a, I wish I would have grabbed that quote because it made no sense. In one of these articles referring to like recent UFO sightings, they use the term conspiracy theorists believe that this was a flying saucer. It's like, what conspiracy? <laughs> what? They conspired to, to do with fly the saucer? Conspiracy theorists. I mean, you could extrapolate, like, if you believe that there's a government conspiracy to keep UFOs from the mainstream, you know, knowledge base, but to just use that term is like conspiracy theorists think. Right. It insert a lot ridiculous theory there. or insert ridiculous statement that's not even conspiracy. That's I don't know. It's very problematic. Frustrating. Used to silence the opposition. And that's mm -hmm. the point, the idea of conspiracy theorists. That term was allegedly given to the media outlets to use in response to anyone that would question the Warren Commission's report right. that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. The JFK assassination? You know, you, instead of calling them concerned citizens, you start calling them conspiracy theorists and you use that over or and over skeptics. again. Skeptics. Right. And skeptics, I think, was a term that was used initially and wasn't necessarily a negative term because, you're, right. oh, you're skeptical. Right. That's a good thing to be. Oh, but you're a conspiracy theorist. Start using that word yeah. and then you can paint Danger. it. And then you, you paint it with like the emotive side. You exactly. Know? You make it like... Tinfoil hat. Yeah, you just make them, you know, real like, what a whack job. Tinfoil hat wearing nobody. Well, and I think the worst part about this in the culture today, it's been pushed from what a weirdo, what a crazy guy to what a dangerous person. Yeah, exactly. That's, That's what's troubling. Level. 
yeah, you're a danger now to the community and mm -hmm. to your, you know, you're into science. You're a danger to other people's minds because that might get out. And yeah, it's crazy. Um, which it's, is not totally false. I mean, like, but I the problem understand. is they, they expand it to yeah. include so many quote conspiracy and they're, theories. They're always the ones that are in charge of reality, which right. is the problem. I mean, yeah, there's definitely, even right now, there's a problem with a lot of misinformation in the Absolutely. world. Absolutely. But the answer isn't to just give the people that lie all the time all the power. And the decision to, to decide who is lying. Right. That's what free speech is for, is you, people have the right to decide what... You should be able to hear the arguments. Otherwise, you're just a communist or fascist nation. Well, speaking of communists, to go back to the idea of uh, JFK, the JFK assassination. So the idea of the CIA, you know, they wouldn't assassinate their own president, right? Um, oh, boy. So... This is interesting. Of course, this is a different leader, but these documents also revealed the name Johnny Roselli and the CIA's failed attempt to use the mafia to assassinate Fidel Castro in 1960. Oh, yeah. While Castro is still alive and kicking, Johnny Roselli is not. His body was found stuffed in an oil drum floating in a Florida canal. So you have uh, attempted assassination, cover up, body found, uh, Johnny Roselli. You can make that same parallel with Lee Harvey Oswald. Right. Attempted assassination. Marilyn Monroe. Cover up. There's some interesting documentation around yeah, that. Yeah, there, there's so much. And the idea that, like, the CIA, I mean, there's so much hatred in the CIA for the Kennedy administration back then. I mean, George Bush Sr., freaking, what's his name? The president, the guy who became president. Lyndon uh, Johnson. Yeah, Lyndon Johnson. He, I mean, you can hear the hatred in his voice for right. him. I mean, that, that's a whole other topic that I think is really interesting. But um, do you guys want to hear a quick clip? Sure. But your point to this whole thing is to say the media can definitely be manipulated by assets from the CIA, clandestine groups within our government, within right. our military. From advertisers mm -hmm. who pay them all the money. Anyways, yes. the next part. <laughs> okay, so the clip we're about to hear, this is from a House Intelligence Committee hearing in 1975. That's the first bit you're going to hear the CIA being asked some pretty tough questions uh, and being very uncomfortable. And then the second part of the clip is going to be Sig Mickelson, who is a former CBS News president, admitting to CIA influence. Oh, okay. And Anderson Cooper. Yes, CIA I mean, that's open information, isn't it? Yeah, we know he worked with the CIA. There's a book on it that's referenced in Wikipedia. That's mm -hmm. the storyline, right? I've, I've never looked deeply into that. He's got such neat glasses. He does have neat glasses. Okay, let's play the clip. Okay. I thought that it was a matter of uh, real concern that planted stories intended to serve a national purpose abroad came home and were circulated here and believed here because uh, this would mean that the CIA could manipulate the news in the United States by channeling it through some foreign country. And we're looking at that very carefully. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation American journal? CIA. We do have people who submit pieces to American journals. Do you have wow. any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks? This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into in executive session. Ooh, a little <laughs> hot under the collar there, Joe. Meaning not for the public to hear. Uh, at CBS. Uh, this is a former president of CBS. We uh, had been contacted by the CIA. As a matter of fact, by the time I became the head of the whole news and public affairs operation in 1954, the ships had been established and I was told about them and asked if I'd carry on with them. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to the National News Services, AP and UPI. Well, again, I think we're getting into the kind of detail, Mr. Chairman, that I'd prefer <laughs> to handle in executive session. Well, Snoobler, this last part's interesting. Would you say that continues today? Yeah, I would think probably for a reporter it would continue today, but because of all of the revelations of the period of the 1970s, uh, it seems to me that a reporter's got to be much more circumspect in doing it now, or he runs the risk of uh, at least being looked at with considerable disfavor by the public. I think you've got to be much more careful about it. Ooh, got to be more careful about it. Yeah, the idea being that they're not just going to be helping you out by giving you information that they have. They're trying to sway the discussion. Right. right. Trying to disseminate information that might not be truthful. Right. Well, they can take a set of facts or information. and So but you're, this is all to say, like, what are your thoughts on disclosure? You, you're thinking, are you leaning more towards that 
well, obviously that the narrative is going to be controlled by yeah. media to maybe there is intelligence out there that's visiting us, but the direction of that story and the discussion is pointed for a certain reason in a certain ways, what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, the sinister possibilities are twofold. One is that the government, the military, whoever knows about these craft, knows about advanced technology, wherever it's coming from, and they want to seem like they don't know about it, so they're willfully being ignorant or pretending like they're ignorant. Yeah, um, I think that's likely. The other prong that I think is also likely is that the reason that they're dripping this for us and admitting to it is that they're setting up some kind of potential, maybe just to have in their back pocket a potential catastrophe, a, a apocalyptic Project Bluebeam type scenario where there's a fake invasion. I mean, that's out there, but they're definitely setting something up or they're willing to let the public be more aware of yeah. whatever is going on. There's going to be a crafted narrative and a crafted outcome if this is going to continue to escalate. Right. I mean, and you know, you can't say 100% sure for everything. There could be people in the government that, I don't know how much power they have, but that do really just want, maybe this has been a secret yeah. for so long that yeah. they know it has to come out at some point. Well, you know, that's possible. That's a good point. And a friend of mine the other day kind of brought that up. Like, what if this is just the outcome of generations of people who were little kids and watched the X-Files or now are getting into higher positions and maybe it's just the open-mindedness of wanting to know or thinking these culture shift in the media. And the right. And I think that's definitely a possibility. I do think it's hard for me to completely shake away the idea that there aren't the powerful people at the very top who are at least, if not already, hoping to control. Right. And, and also or I think- use it in yeah, a certain in a certain, way. Exactly. And I think, you know, one person who would argue that point is Dr. Stephen Greer, who, if you've seen his recent film, and he's said this many times, but The Fifth Kind, I think, Close Counters The Fifth Kind, where he talks about this current move to talk about these things and these sightings and the Pentagon confirming him. His message is basically be wary that they use terms like swarming our ships, things like this to make us think this is a danger. Invasion. We need to control the situation in basically weaponized, weaponized space. space. These are guys are bad coming for us. His yeah. belief obviously is that they're all good, which I don't completely agree that that no. is necessarily the truth either. But the fact that the government can use this as a tool right. to, to enact more control, isn't that yeah, far we'll out? We'll have to really, if something really does happen, and they start wanting more control, like that's when we have to be really careful. Yeah, that's yeah. Not yes. that we can do anything right. about it, but at least we know, you know, be aware. be aware of what's going yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted to think maybe these things that are controlling this craft, whether extra dimensional, extraterrestrial, inner earth or whatever, under sea Atlantis people, if you want to think that maybe they are benevolent and we're not hearing from them directly and the only messages we're getting are from the people up top in our own administrations and government around the yeah. world, then you have to start to think critically about what they're saying. Just because they're admitting there are aliens out or UFOs or whatever doesn't mean that what they're telling you is the truth about those phenomena. Because they're the ones feeding you the information. It's hard for me to believe that if things escalate that we're going to get the truth of it. Yeah, I mean, that's just where I just don't have a lot of faith in powerful organizations and yeah. politicians at this point. And you've seen so much corruption over the decades, you know, and you've seen and so many examples. And now going to come clean and be it's hard truthful. To, it's hard to believe. I hope, I hope that's the case. That'd be great. Hard to believe. A great point, I think, on this is with the CIA, it's not in their purview to work on American soil. That's against their, that's illegal for them to do, and yet they've done it. Mm -hmm. um, but interestingly, in 2013, with the renewal of the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, it included an amendment, you guys might remember this, to, quote, legally carry out misinformation campaigns against the American people. Oh, I forgot about that. Remember that? Mm -mm. They basically, with the amendments to the NDAA, <laughs> under, for reasons of national security, they can carry out misinformation campaigns against the American people. Basically just propaganda campaigns to yeah. get people to think a certain Which way. Which used to be illegal. And now it and, is. And that's, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, to a certain to level, be, that's just done. It's just so obvious at this point that all the news says exactly the same thing. They're like lockstep. That's the nec next Operation clip. Lockstep. You want to play the next clip? It's an example of that. What is this clip? You guys might have seen this on different comedy shows they've done. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I was yeah. going to mention this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And this happens all, I've seen a bunch of compilations. Yeah, like I just this. grabbed this before the show. Our, our greatest, greatest responsibility, responsibility is to, to serve, serve our, our Treasure Valley communities. The El Paso, Las Cruces communities. We'll put this in the notes. Eastern Iowa communities. Mid-Michigan communities. We are extremely proud of the quality, balanced journalism that CBS4 News produces. But. And they start to overlap them. We are concerned about the trouble and trying to be responsible. 
One-sided news stories plaguing our country. Plaguing our country. One-sided news stories. Bias and false news has become all too common on social media. Hear it every day on the radio. Same message over and over. More alarming, some media outlets publish the same fake stories without checking facts first. The sharing of bias. <laughs> Repeating facts false first. False news has, has become, become all too common, common on, on social, social media. media. <laughs> More alarming, some media outlets. <laughs> I have mine. It's just so ironic. And this is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 This is extremely dangerous. Dangerous to our democracy. Dangerous. Extremely dangerous. Our democracy. Extremely dangerous to our democracy. But they're all reading the same script. That's the point. Okay, yeah. This is what is dangerous to our democracy, is stuff yeah. like this. And the irony, I think you guys were all laughing about it during the clip, that they're talking specifically about this, not looking into facts, just repeating information, which exactly. is exactly what they're all doing. It's so aggravating. Yeah, it's just, this happens so much now. It drives me nuts just because everything done. is upside down. Everything they say is the inversion of reality. It's yeah. almost 100% that way. It's frustrating to have to hear it all the time. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I mean, that's why I don't watch TV. Yeah, I know? don't. The only time I really hear it is on the radio because I listen to talk radio. And when they do their news segments of Main Street, like ABC or whatever, right. it's just the same old droning, exactly like that, what right. we just played, the exact same thing. Non-investigative, just repeating a yeah, script. Yeah, they're just reading a script. Yeah. You know that a thousand other stations are and doing. The point is that it's the same script. I think yeah. that's the concern. Do they not have a soul? I guess maybe they don't know. Well, there's that. actors. Yeah, they, and extent. they may not know. I mean, but that they don't do any actual journalism. Yeah, though. I don't know at what stage up the chain where you're actually doing journalism. You get to have your own thoughts. When you do that, you get kicked out out of the journalism. <laughs> like. right. Unless you're in the right mindset. Anyway, uh, so pyramids? They are out Keep there. Your, I mean, it did, make, it it did freak me out. It should be interesting. We will, I mean, we'll probably do an update episode. I'm sure, yeah. I kind of have a feeling there's going to be more of this stuff yeah. coming. And I think if, you know, if you think that this is part of the disclosure thing, you know, who knows what's at the other end of this and what's real and what's not. But I feel like the disclosure seems pretty apparent that it is occurring to some degree. Whether or not we get to that 180 day mark in July and we have some revelation or whether it's just more of a shrug it's definitely possible right but we'll it's definitely controlled, be you know or not it will definitely be doing more i'm, sh I'm sure we'll have more things coming like out along the way something going to be dropped because why would they put it in the bill if they didn't have a plan on doing something about it yeah that's kind of a good point so we'll see yeah but we will update you as more ufo events happen and it did creep me out last night i was just going to say walking outside clear night and just after head in the books and on the last couple of days looking at this stuff and just thinking like these pyramid things that are allegedly a lot of these accounts. And that's the other thing we didn't get into. A lot of stuff from Luis Elizondo, all these other people saying like, this is the tip of the iceberg. Like there's so much more that's there. And this is coming from insiders within the Pentagon saying there are images and video of things that are 50 feet from cockpits. We're seeing the bottom of the that barrel of the evidence. Me in the least bit. So to think about that and then to be outside and look up and see like, we can't see these things with our eyes most of the time. We're just seeing the tip of the pyramid. Nice. They're right above you all times. So. Yeah. Guys, keep your eyes to the skies and uh, let us know what you see. Well, hopefully we've we'll seen the expansion. We're going to do an awesome episode. Really, it's going to be pretty engaging, I think, on schoolyard UFO encounters. Yay! These are pretty crazy. It's surprising there's been hundreds I was not aware. I was familiar with a couple of the famous ones from South Africa and Australia, but there's been hundreds of cases, even here in Ohio. Um, so we're going to get into UFOs those. UFOs coming down a little to... looser, a little more bantery, a bit yeah. of fun stories. So I might have to have a couple drinks after this. You want to support this. the whole? Come on over and sign up, and we would love to have you. Absolutely. Come visit the playgrounds of the schools with the UFOs, I guess. I don't know. That was a bad <laughs> description. Really bad. There's UFOs at school. All right, we'll see you guys there. And uh, until next time, we'll see you on... The belief hole. The belief hole. <laughs>
like that song that goes skid a rinky dinky dink skid a rinky do i love you skid a rinky dinky dink skid a rinky do i love What's happening you in my life <laughs> right <laughs> staring now. in john's eyes <laughs> i was, love you in the morning and in the afternoon i love you in the evening and underneath even in the moon i used to think it was even in the nude growing up even in the nude, it was get a marinky dinky dink, get a marinky do. I love you, I really mean it. Yes, sir, I really mean it. I love, love you, no, don't forget it. I love you. Ba doop boop, give me a tooth. I want to sparkle that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs>